Guess who's back? We are back. USD model ASEAN meeting is back. For its ninth installation, this day, the three. Join us as we delve again into the riveting arena of ASEAN diplomacy. Stay tuned for more updates. Guess who's back? We are back. USD model ASEAN meeting is back. For its ninth installation, this day, the three. Join us as we delve again into the riveting arena of ASEAN diplomacy. Stay tuned for more updates. Guess who's back? We are back. USD model ASEAN meeting is back. For its ninth installation, this day, the three. Join us as we delve again into the riveting arena of ASEAN diplomacy. Stay tuned for more updates.
Good day, everyone, wherever in the world you may be. I'm Joy Alampay, Executive Director of Asia Society Philippines. We promote understanding and bridge cultures between and among peoples and countries through education, policy, technology, sustainability, culture, and the arts, spanning discussions and activities beyond the surface. This year's ASEAN Month celebration is with the theme of addressing challenges together and the key priority is strengthening people-to-people -people bonds to enhance the spirit of one ASEAN identity. It is also in this spirit that the Asia Society Philippines turns to Dr. Nicole Koenyinga Boitis and her presentation on Asia in turn of the century, turn of the 20th century Filipino political thought and action. Dr. Kuenying Aboitis underscores the history of intellectual cross-pollination between the Philippines and its neighbors. And together with the Manila House and the Department of History of the Ateneo de Manila University, we welcome you to this most timely discussion. We are most grateful as well for the support of the De La Salle University College of Liberal Arts, the Far Eastern University Institute of Arts and Sciences, and the University of Santo Tomas Asian Studies Society. And now, I'm pleased to introduce our moderator for today, Dr. Carl Ian Uy Cheng Chua. Carl received his doctorate in social science from Hitotsubashi University. He was former director of the Japanese Studies Program of the Ateneo de Manila University and has been an Asia Public Intellectual Junior Fellow and is currently a Japan Foundation Japanese Studies Fellow. He is part of the editorial board of the Social Sciences Diliman and East Asian Journal of Popular Culture, and a steering committee member of the Japanese Studies Association of Southeast Asia. Carl, welcome. Hi, um, good afternoon, everyone. And welcome to uh, this talk. Oh, there you go. Uh, <laughs> we were we, we had a very we had a little bit of a a, a shock because um, Nicole's place had a problem. All right. So um, first of all, welcome and hope um, and hopefully you can um, welcome to our guests. Um, first of all, I'd like to introduce our um, speaker, uh, Nicole Kuiheng. Um, Aboitis uh, is a research fellow at the Claire uh, at Claire Hall, supervisor in world history and the executive de director of the uh, Toynbee Prize Foundation. She was a postdoctorate fellow at the Weatherhead Center for International Affairs at Harvard University. Uh, her current research analyzes the co-constitution of class and relationships with the natural environment over the 19th and 20th centuries in the Philippines. However, um, her current talk will be on um, the Philippines and Asia on the turn of the 20th century. So um, part of the reason that I was actually assigned to, <laughs> to uh, moderate for Nicole was because I was one of the few that um, had to write, uh, had to um, read her book um, for another paper that I was doing on Japan. So it's going to be interesting to see her thoughts and to personally ask her about uh, my own opinions later on in our um, Q&A and commentary session. So um, Nicole has around 45 minutes. Um, you have the floor. Thank you so much. I'll get right to it because clearly I'm not coming to you from Cambridge where I, where I work. I'm here in Shargao and we just had a little brownout and I'm afraid we're about to have another. So I'm just going to speed through this. Um, I'm going to share my screen. Um, oh my, I don't think my sharing screen is enabled. My desktop one is. Okay. Does that work? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> The important global moment of the late 19th century, with all the changes in technology, sovereignty, and human exchange and ideology that it wrought, is too often apprehended in Asian historiography through a bilateral framework privileging relations with the West. For example, with studies of, on the one hand, Vietnam and France, and on the other, the Philippines and the US. The long Philippine revolution, 
1896 to 1905, which began against Spain and continued against the United States of America, took place against a backdrop of imperial incorporation and local resistance that was truly region-wide. This backdrop includes the French conquest of Cambodia, Vietnam, and Laos, and the creation of French Indochina by 1897, and in response to 1885 to 1888 Khan Vuong movement in the country that would become Vietnam, a contemporaneous anti-French revolt in Cambodia, the 1903 to 1905 activism of the Vietnamese scholar gentry, as well as the full extension of direct Dutch colonial rule throughout the Netherlands East Indies from 1872 to 1910, against stiff resistance, especially in Aceh, the centralization of British power in the Federated Malay States from the 1890s to the 1910s, the British annexation of Upper Burma following the Third Anglo-Burmese War in 1885, the incorporation of Burma as a province of British India by 1897, and the formation of the Burmese Nationalist Movement continuing into the 1920s. This era also saw the emergence of Japan as a non-Western imperial power after the Meiji Restoration of 1868, the early exertion of its dominance over Korea in 1876, culminating in its annexation in 1910, as well as the Japanese annexation and incorporation of Taiwan beginning in 1895. Yet this important transnational and regional historical setting has barely been incorporated into the locally and Western oriented historiography of the Philippine Revolution. The historical literature treats the Philippine Revolution as if it happened in a completely different corner of the world entirely, without reference to this transnational regional setting at all. Indeed, my ongoing focus on the Asian context to Philippine history runs counter to the traditional assumption of the literature, the assumption that the Filipino self-image is historically non-Asian, seeing itself as belonging to the Western hemisphere. Early post-war and Cold War Southeast Asian studies, such as DGE Hall's seminal works, excluded the Philippines from studies of the region entirely. Meanwhile, internationalization of the Philippine Revolution's historiography has generally occurred along imperial lines, analyzing it with or against the former Western imperial powers or the former colonies of Spain and the US, such as Puerto Rico. My book, Asian Place, Filipino Nation, a global intellectual history of the Philippine Revolution, 1887 to 1912, on which this talk is based, is the first work to deeply contextualize Philippine revolutionary and political thought in the intellectual ferment and international contests of power then brewing in Southeast and East Asia. Though the talk I'm about to present to you today does not have time to do so, my book opens a comparison between the contemporaneous Vietnamese scholar gentry political opposition in French Indochina with that of the Ilustrados and Catipuneros in the Philippines. Today I'll focus on discussing the construction of Asia and the presence of Asianism in the founding of the Filipino nation and the history of the Philippine Revolution. Until the propaganda movement of the Ilustrado Filipinos, who were, of course, the educated elite, began constructing their idea of the Filipino nation in the 1880s, no concept of Filipino yet existed. Their work was largely channeled through the European-based fortnightly newspaper La Solidaridad, in this process, the propaganda movement inscribed the new Philippine nation within a more ancient Asian landscape imbued with civilizational importance recognizable even to the Europeans, rather than arising on an island with no visible ancient ruins or historical grandeur. The propagandists apparently thought this association with an older, richer, documented civilizational realm necessary due to the visible lack of ancient kingdoms and ruins around which Filipinos could assemble their own unique Filipinized nationalism. For example, the propagandists sought to recover their Tagalog language, a member of the Malayo-Polynesian linguistic family, as a marker of autonomy and identity. The propagandists developed a Tagalog orthography, Filipino national hero Jose Rizal wrote to fellow propagandist Mariano Ponte excitedly in 1888, quote, the new Tagalog orthography that we are using is perfectly in accord with the ancient writing and with the Sanskrit origin of many Tagalog words, as I have found out through my research in the British Museum, end quote. Thus, this act of recovery succeeded not only in effecting a symbolic separation from Spain, but also restored Tagalog supposedly to its pre-colonial Asian world. In La Solidaridad, Asia largely appears as constructed through the history of civilization as, and is noted for its heights of achievement, albeit in a defensive tone. An important feature in this construction of Asia through the history of civilization was the premise that there's something like universal civilization and that it merely passed from one incarnation to another, from east to west and back again. This ephemeral unitary concept of civilization formed the mechanism by which the Ilustrados civilizational construction of Asia 
reconciled itself with the history of the rise and fall of great powers and the current state of material inequality between East and West. It's interesting to note that this is precisely the theoretical premise that would later characterize World War II wartime Japanese-sponsored President Jose Pilarel's historical and political thinking and that grounded his Asianism. From this generalized Asia, we can move to specificities of place, to which end I wish to read from a poem. Quote, a plant I am that scarcely grown was torn from out its Eastern bed, where all around perfume is shed and life but as a dream is known, end quote. These are the opening lines of a poem by Rizal written in 1882 in Madrid for his mother. Though Filipinas, by which term I referred to the Spanish colony before the creation of the Philippine nation, had barely known its own surroundings and taken root, having scarcely grown, it was located firmly within the cradle of the East, its Eastern bed. Moreover, there's something seemingly destined to a form of development rooted at home in Asia, while the work to uproot the Philippines from its Eastern bed was presented as unnatural. The Eastern bed of perfume and dreams was not only natural, but also Edenic in Rizal's formulation. Many Western empires premise their conquest and civilizing mission on the enshrinement of a certain idea, a manifestation of reason, as endowing them with the right to rule, whether the due earthly dominion of Christianity under the Spanish or the technological capacity to till the land and assume true ownership over it under the British. As such, some of the strongest critics of various empires rested their arguments on place, on the legitimate affective ties of place and group, with these affinities providing in and of themselves claim to rule. Place figures this political and affective plane as the decidedly non-universal plane upon which to attach and organize a geography of political affinity in the manner of Edmund Burke. Burke's understanding of place is both territorial the significance of a particular physical space with its history, land, rivers, and monuments, and social, involving origins, distinctions, social position. In his understanding, place gave location to individual and collective identities and really had both kinds of identities to one another. Place was movable, serving as a localized counterpoint to the universal enlightenment ideals that so often animated non-Western nationalism and nation states in this period, and yet could seem insufficiently specific on their own. It's thus also a window through which one may see the Asian and Asianist nationalisms that mobilize place as something other than merely a co-opting of Western formulations of the nation state and its foundational ideals, though that work was also underway, of course. Anti-colonial nationalists in Asia at the turn of the 20th century grounded their enlightenment influence ideals in a politics and ideology of place that brought imagined historical, cultural and racial specificity and logics to, pair, to bear upon their nationalisms and argued that such effective rootedness was their political source of legitimacy. <clears throat> Place provided an entry point for nationalisms constructed in universalist Western grammar to become particularized and specified, even exceptionalized in certain imaginations. They thus also opened articulations of anti-colonial nationalism to natural interpretations of race and geographical belonging. At a speech in honor of Senor Becerra, a liberal Spanish statesman, on December 23, 1890, reprinted in La Solidaridad, Graciano Lopez Jaena invoked place, geography and the environment, as a language through which to highlight the vulnerability of imported culture. Quote, remember one thing more, gentlemen. It is now an incontrovertible fact that there is a time when the Philippines form part of Asia, it was separated to form an archipelago and therefore will not be reunited again, nor will it disappear. But on its surface, great changes frequently occur due to the fact that water, which is filtered across those layers of clay, lime, and volcanic soil, gets to the spheroidal state and to a temperature higher than that of water vapor." End quote. He went on to describe what this heralded, quote, it acquires tremendous force, seeks the line of least resistance, and destroys and sweeps everything away, end quote. This was a warning that without reforms to stabilize foreign civilizational and cultural transformations, a place can and will exert force through its own older natural forms. For that is the quote, line of least resistance, the one that is natural and foundational. La Solidaridad's newspapers, poetry, eulogized this place's rivers to which it imputed an automatic knowledge and affinity on the part of the Filipinos. And its theorizations on race attributed unique developments arising from its climate and environment. The poem Los Cantos del Pasig by Rafael Quina de la Rosa, published in La Soledad in 1893, uses the river of the Pasig in a Tagalog-speaking region to help ground Filipino place, 
stirring Filipino feeling and indeed constructing it through a shared reference seemingly bereft of class and division upon which could rest the kind of collective leveling premise required for an emergent nationalism. Quote, son of the Pasig, your brown face dreams peacefully of this shady woods in the simple house of your love, end quote. Filipino nationalism here, which is related to place and to the natural, subtly introduces race, quote, your brown face, which the illustrators understood as related to adaptive evolution and attuned to one's particular environment and climate. Such a particularized evolution only makes place that much more natural and important, embedded as it is in one's historical racial development. Yet, despite La Solidaridad's best efforts, the Pasig River was not yet metonymic and unable to substitute for the nationalism or nation it was meant to symbolize, particularly at this point when regional and ethno-linguistic divisions would have painted the reference as decidedly Tagalog and urban rather than Filipino. The Katipunan in the lead up to the Philippine Re revolution would take this grounding primacy of place a step further invoking Inang Bayan. From a location within a civilizational Asia to a specific grounding in place of the Philippines, the last relevant geography of political affinity is the Illustrada's construction of the Malay race. Filipino nationalist writings of the period commonly referred to Filipinos as belonging to the Malay race and used evidence found in European scholarship to argue that Filipinos were of Malay civilization in their languages, customs, religious beliefs, social institutions, psychology, and cultural practices. This emphasis on being part of the Malay race was a way to counter Spanish and European thinkers who described the archipelago as overrun by an anarchy of tribes and races. <clears throat> Rizal declared himself to be Malayo Tagalog, and in his 1890 annotations to the Sucesos de las Islas Filipinas por el Dr. Antonio de Morga, explored hypotheses of shared racial and civilizational origins for Filipinos with Sumatrans, Polynesians, and even Japanese. Rizal's Paris-based organization, Indios Bravos, agreed on a secret agenda of liberating first the Philippines, then Borneo, Indonesia, and Malaya. Facing Spanish persecution, Rizal spent a week in 1892 traveling through Sandak and Borneo and present-day Malaysia to seek a land grant from the British government to establish a Filipino colony at home amongst their purported racial brothers. La Solidaridad reinforced the Filipino connection to the larger Malay world throughout its issues, casually reporting new Malay publications and studies as part of Filipinas' assumed sphere of interest and concern. In an 1895 article, La Solidaridad proudly declared, quote, the Japanese are Malay and the Filipino inhabitants are Malay. Those who have closely studied the Malay race and its ancient civilization cannot cast aside the qualities of nobility and virility that characterize the Malay, end quote. It also hotly challenged the idea that Filipinos were not Malay. Mariana Ponce dedicated an article to the Spanish writer Vicente Barantes, and in it wrote, quote, His Excellency has the nerve to say that the Malay element is not exclusive, not even preponderant in the Philippines. To what race then do the Filipinos belong? All ethnographers of the world will be grateful to His Excellency if he were to surprise us with the news that the natives, with the exception of the Negritos, do not belong to the Malay race. And not only the scholars would be grateful, but even the children of the primary schools of Austria and Germany, because they know from their teachers." End quote. The deep offense taken at Barantes' assertion reveals just how much the Illustrator's civilizational and racial pride depended upon their identification with the Malays. It also underscores the instability of these racial constructions and how global hierarchies and international perceptions of civilizational achievement were deeply implicated in their constructed nationalism even as the illustrators claim to disavow them. Indeed, the easy disavowal of the negritos, which was a blanket term for the natives, animus in tribal Filipinos in Ponce's article, evidences the implicit workings of an internalized sense of hierarchy. The negritos of the Philippines were either a liability to the illustrator's quest to win political and civilizational recognition for the Filipinos, or an easy instrument by which to shore up their own racial superiority, a way to say to Europe, nuance your denigration of Filipinos. Your stereotypes might fit them, but not us. Writing from Paris in 1888, Filipino painter Juan Luna wrote Jose Rizal, quote, tell me about your travel impressions, especially about your stay in Japan, whose people is so attractive to me. I'm an enthusiastic admirer of their painting, and I think that it is as advanced as that of Greece and Italy. We should study more that country whom we resemble so much, end quote. 
While in Japan, Rizal was reportedly taken for a Japanese man. Further, in his contribution to Trubner's record in July 1889, Rizal compared the Tagalog and Japanese versions of the fable of the tortoise and the monkey and suggested a possible Malay origin of the Japanese people. While in Japan, he formed a romantic relationship with a young woman, Osei-san. Yet, in the pages of La Solidaridad, Japan appears less a kindred Malay relative to the Filipinos, despite protestations to that effect, than an alternate future or an alternate vision of possibility, one made possible precisely through this resemblance that Luna and Rizal assert. This resemblance we can assume to be geographical, for the Japanese were largely unlike the Filipinos except through their common location in an Asia beset by Western imperialism and through a geographic construction of an Asian race. Meanwhile, Jose Rizal asserted in his famous article Sobre la Indolencia de los Filipinos in 1890 that the Spanish government itself recognized racial similarity and affinity not only between the Filipinos and other Malays, but also with the Japanese. Quote, fearing to have the Filipinos deal frequently with other individuals of their own race who are free and independent, as the Borneans, the Siamese, the Cambodians, and the Japanese, people who in their customs and feelings differ greatly from the Chinese, the government acted toward these others with great mistrust and great severity until they finally ceased to come to the country, end quote. The ethnic Chinese commercial minority in Filipinas was the target of prejudice in the pages of La Solidaridad. There are repeated references in the paper to differences between the Malay Filipino and their cynic neighbors in Asia, particularly regarding cynic vice. Thus, in this interpretation, the Chinese stood apart from the rest of Asia, while the Japanese stood with the Southeast Asians and Filipinos racially and culturally, even though the Japanese were integrated members of the cynic world. The inclusion of the Japanese, but not the Chinese on these terms, seems a difficult paradox to reconcile, particularly given the mixed Chinese ethnicity of the propagandists themselves, except through the propagandist desire to aggrandize the Filipinos by claiming the Japanese as among their racial kind, while holding a status superior to the pure, culturally unassimilated Chinese immigrants in their midst, in the same manner as the Spanish did. While employing race as a category and treating races as real, the illustrators argued against a fixed ranking of the races, arguing instead for a multilinear evolutionism rather than a deterministic, genetic, or progressive Darwinism. However, their use of racial categories had its own hierarchizing logic and involved responses to Western practices of ranking that only served to legitimize the framework of that hierarchizing as their complex relationship with their own Chinese and animist Filipino tribal brothers illustrates. In Filipinas Dentro de Cien Años, Rizal's famous 1889 article, he discussed his effort to reawaken the Filipinos who quote, forgot their writings, their songs, their poetry, their laws, in order to learn by heart other doctrines which they did not understand, other ethics, other tastes, different from those inspired in their race by their climate and their way of thinking, end quote. His mention of climate and consonant ways of thinking carved into race a certain natural and concrete reality. Here, race is not merely a social construction. Further, it is inalienable from place, from a place in which it evolved with its particular climate and evolutionary thread. Now I turn from this general Pan-Asianism and general Asianism to a more specific Pan-Asianism. The last quarter of the 19th century saw a global increase of violence, monopoly capitalism, and direct colonial rule that was bound up in the intensified Western imperial struggle to partition the world, and the famous 1881 to 1914 scramble to Africa among the Western imperial powers that greatly increased the sense of insecurity in the rest of the world. Pan-Asian discourse, which emanated mainly from Japan and China originally, advocated Asian solidarity under the aid of Japan against the encroachments of Western imperialism, internalizing a loose belief in a vague evolutionary Darwinism in which mutual aid and cooperation among those of like races and cultures would allow for better competition and they were in what they perceived to be a global competition of survival of the fittest among nations. Um, so the mainstream thread of Japanese Pan-Asian thought was Sinocentric and the discourse stressed the um, characteristics I have up on the screen. Um, and the understanding of a common destiny 
um, in an Asian struggle against Western imperialism and at times against Westernization or even modernization um, was something that was shared with the Taoist thread, which is a different thread, which focused on, on Asia as one thesis and was more inclusive. Um, and the Meishuron thread was a more muscular ideology in which Japan sought to lead and remake Asia in its own image. Now, when I mentioned before the idea of a common destiny, that was the intellectual vehicle that Southeast Asian Pan-Asianists used to challenge the mainstream cynic delimitation of Pan-Asianism. In the more radical threads of Pan-Asianism and among their adherents in the periphery outside Japan, the Asia in Pan-Asianism would come to include all of oppressed Asia writ large. This was particularly true after the Russo-Japanese War of 1904 to 1905, but began as early as the Sino-Japanese War of 1894 to 1895 for Filipino Asianist nationalists. The existing literature attends to the successive failures to transnationalize Pan-Asianism within the cynic world, highlighting Japanese-Chinese rivalry and the failure to extend Pan-Asianism to Korea. But it ignores the Pan-Asianism of the non-cynic periphery. The revolutionary First Philippine Republic's foreign collaboration represents the first instance of fellow Pan-Asianists lending material aid toward anti-colonial revolution against the Western power, rather than the overthrow of a domestic dynasty, and harnessing transnational Pan-Asian networks of support, activism, and association toward doing so. This material dimension is crucial to understanding the Pan-Asianism of the colonized periphery and to incorporating the periphery into this history. So too is the affective dimension in which fantasies, imagination, and a certain emotionality form much of the periphery's engagement with the model of Meiji era Japan and Asian solidarity. My book argues for the importance of both dimensions as lenses through which the Pan-Asianism Pan of the periphery can be recognized and made legible to the workings of the center. So what was the Philippine Pan-Asian vision? The Filipino Asianist Asianism was multidimensional, providing a civilizational and racial buttress to their formulations of na nation and rightful self-rule within a global social Darwinist framework, and assisting in a regrounding of place as the basis for rightful political sovereignty in their anti-colonialism. Their explicit Pan-Asian vision, meanwhile, was diverse, pragmatic, and loose, centered on Japanese material aid and leadership, which involved directly learning from Japan's successful social Darwinist adaptation to preserve its native and Asian culture while integrating modern innovations and forming a solidarity union of Asian nations and races in what was perceived to be a coming race war. The Filipino Asianists saw themselves in their revolution as leading the charge toward an anti-colonial future within colonized Asia leading what they saw as brethren Malay nations toward that shared vision and working alongside the modern leader of Japan. To that end, their Pan-Asian vision involved both the explicitly nationalist goals of the constituent nations, as well as the realpolitik internationalist visions of racial solidarity within a loose regional transnational Pan-Asian organization. Indeed, because of the racialized social Darwinist frame through which they interpreted the international sphere, they believed nationalism and racialized internationalism to be existentially, pragmatically necessary and entangled. When Rizal gave up on the propaganda movement in Europe and returned to Asia in 1892, having decided that the appropriate battlefield was at home, it marked the beginning of a new phase to the anti-colonial struggle. The propaganda movement that began in 1875 was ultimately abandoned by many of those who gave up on the slow work of publishing arguments for reform. As revolutionaries and anti-colonial thinkers faced increasing Spanish crackdown in Filipinas, they moved to Hong Kong, Singapore, and especially Yokohama where they would harness anti-colonial pan-Asianist networks and attempt to aid the Philippine Revolution. The Katipunan um, that would begin the Philippine Revolution upon the failure of the propaganda movement that came before it was the direct intellectual inheritor of this work by the propaganda movement to construct an Asian Philippine nation. And one finds precisely this propaganda's theoretical argumentation, emphasis on the Philippines' Asian heritage, and turn towards Japan as a new symbol of power in the writings, initiation rites, and private letters of the Katipuneros and the revolutionaries of the First Philippine Republic. While the Katipuna looked back to the Filipinos' pre-colonial civilization and history, much like the propagandists did, it did not seek to resurrect native, the native past or indigenous customs. The revolution's intellectual history was international in favor. More specifically, the revolution was attuned to the modern colonized world and to Asia. 
The Katipuneros perceived their own battle as part of a wider transnational war. They cheered the rebels in Cuba, wanted to establish a presence in Hong Kong, and sought aid from Japan. The Katipunan understood Philippine history as part of Asian history, and they located Filipinas' pre-colonial condition of independence and autonomy as occurring within the temporal and spatial ambit of Asia. The importance that this originary sovereign autonomy held gave Asia itself a corollary importance in the Katipunan's imaginary. Katipunan's initiation life included a formulae performative recitation of the Katipunan's promulgated interpretation of the Gallic history. What was the condition of the Katagalugan in early times? The initiator asked. To this, the initiate had been coached to respond that the Filipinos had their own civilization, alphabet, and religion before the Spaniards arrived. They enjoyed political liberty, used artillery, wore clothes of silk, and maintained diplomatic and commercial relations with their Asian neighbors. Not only Asia generally, Bonifacio also employed Japan specifically as a powerful symbol of Asian achievement and freedom from the West, in much the same way that the propaganda movement had. The famous revolutionary uh, rallying cry attributed to Bonifacio begins with the primary assertion, quote, in the early days, when the Spaniards had not yet set foot on our soil, this Catagalugan was governed by our compatriots and enjoyed a life of great abundance, prosperity, and peace. She maintained good relations with her neighbors, especially with the Japanese, and traded with them in goods of all kinds. As a result, everyone had wealth and behaved with honor, end quote. For its part, the Katipuna tried repeatedly to contact the Japanese government and to collaborate with Japanese sympathizers to their cause. Though ultimately official Japanese aid never came, Japanese sympathizers were always to be found and they did render unofficial aid. I'll now tally this Filipino Asianist organizing to get a sense of Pan-Asianism in motion. This is not all solidarity, unity and brotherhood. Pan-Asianism was a romantic fantasy and trafficked in emotionality and bonds of friendship upon which the networks of aid and political organizing rested, but it was grounded in power calculations and instrumentalized by those in colonized Southeast Asia for nationalist purposes, first and foremost. In the newly racialized geopolitical and intellectual framework, the colonized believed this racial solidarity necessary to their political projects. So Japanese Foreign Minister Okuma obtained permission from the US government for military shishi Captain Tokizawa to accompany US troops in the Philippines as an observer. Although in the Philippines with Americans, Tokizawa freely passed a lot of sensitive information back to the Philippine revolutionaries, including the fact that he was told the Americans would attack Manila three days hence. In 1898, once Aguinaldo was setting up his government and the first Philippine Republic, he named former propagandist, uh, foreign propagandist Mariano Ponce, the Philippine foreign emissary to Japan a mission that ranked fourth out of 28 budget items of the Aguinaldo government. Ponce lived in Japan from June 1898 to March 1901. He met Japanese officials and persons of all levels and joined and attended meetings of various Asianist societies, including the Oriental Young Men's Society, which included Koreans, Chinese, Japanese, Indians, Siamese, and Filipinos as members. And he gained the patience of prominent Japanese politicians. Within the society, the problems of Korea and the Philippines were topics of active discussion. In Japan, Ponce met the Chinese Confucian scholar Kang Yu Wei, who led the Hundred Days of Reform, the exiled leaders of the Korean Reform Movement, Korean government, and Prince Park Yong Hyo, as well as the Chinese revolutionary and future president of the Republic of China, Sun Yat sen, with whom he became lifelong friends. Ponce, um, if you could. I'm yeah? sorry, um, can you slow down slightly for the audience? Okay, I hope my I hope my electricity keeps going. Um, Ponce fielded individual Japanese supporters to train the Philippine Revolutionary Army. Several Japanese volunteers sailed to the Philippines to train Aguinaldo's army, along with arms and ammunition. The Hong Kong Committee was also successful in procuring arms for the First Philippine Republic. Important to this Pan-Asianism in motion was affect. At a dinner party hosted by prominent Japanese politicians. In Yukai Ki, um, Ponce met Sun Yat-sen. Sun Yat-sen asked his Japanese friends Miyazaki Toten and Hirayama Shu to help arrange a purchase of arms for the Philippine Revolution. Miyazaki says in 1899, Sun asked him, quote, is there any way you can get guns and ammunition to the Philippines? There is a representative of the Independence Army in Yokohama. Since I have planned to go to the Philippines with you, I visited this man and revealed my secret support for him. He was overjoyed and promptly entrusted me with a great matter. The import of guns. It was our very first meeting and see how he trusted me. I must do everything within my power for this cause. Moreover, this man's spirit is exactly the same as ours. 
I want to ask you to use all of your strength for these valorous Filipinos, end quote. Here, the role of emotion and affinity is pivotal. See how he trusted me, forming bonds that would underpin the political ideology of Asian solidarity through fantasy and affection. Miyazaki wrote, quote, my heart was instantly aflame. Soon, Hirayama and I made secret plans, and I resolved to reveal these dunaki and to tap his wisdom, end quote. Note again the role of emotion. Indeed, Miyazaki saw himself as romantically working for the region of East Asia, which he understood in racial terms, writing of himself as, quote, romantically as always, a chivalrous hero, working for the colored races of mankind, and not as the servant of his country, nor his emperor, end quote. Once his stay in Japan was success, success, mostly in terms of delivering intelligence to the Hong Kong junta and in shaping foreign Asian opinion on the rightness of the Philippine revolution. His work, Western Filipina, was serialized in Keiko Renipo, published as a book in Tokyo, translated into Chinese, published in Shanghai, and even reissued as late as 1913. Rebecca Carl argues that for Chinese intellectuals, it was this piece by Ponce that first persuasively cast colonialism as a global discursive problem, a characterization that not only facilitated the universalization of the Philippine national experience well beyond its particularity, but one that endured well beyond the duration of the Philippine situation itself. Indeed, you have Asian leaders as late as Sukarno in Indonesia, referencing the Philippine revolution and Rizal as inspiration. In terms of his pan-Asianism, one of the most important moments in Ponce's Japan-based correspondence is his request to the first Philippine Republic in 1898 that the Filipino and Chinese revolutionaries work together and help each other's cause with Japanese support. The view of the Japanese in putting us in contact, Chinese reformers and Filipino revolutionaries, is that we help each other mutually, Ponce explained. For the Japanese government's suggestion, Kang Yu Wei of the Chinese Reformist Party wished to establish a working agreement with the first Philippine Republic. Quote, if, for example, we repair some of our isolated ports to be deposits of weapons, ammunition, and supplies of the Chinese revolutionaries, from which points our military can arm itself, in exchange for the service, it would be easy for us to secure first use of these weapons in our deposit, Ponce explained. Additionally, this partnership could also eventually provide the Filipino government with a new source of loan money. Moreover, Ponce argued, it is a just cause, legitimate, and the Filipinos should support it. Its triumph would be of great importance for the future of the Far East. And it's another reason why we should not look upon this reformist movement with indifference." End quote. This was something that Ponce truly believed, that the Philippine nation and Philippine revolution were part of a larger Asian community and were central actors in an Asian anti-imperial, anti-Western history. Pan-Asianism and the example of Meiji Japan through their assertion of the unique fruits of Asian culture and proof of successful Asian modernization supported the legitimacy and perceived viability of Asian nationalist claims of rightful sovereignty over their countries in spite of their country's relative failure in a social Darwinist geopolitical competition. The content of the pan-Asian imaginary and proposition on part of the periphery, however, did not merely amount to a new strategy, strategy within the same social Darwinist struggle. The peripheral pan-Asianists asserted that the Asia within pan-Asia would embody a rightful moral grounding to geopolitics, which they judged as lacking in the international sphere, and which they asserted was the unique offering of Asia. This dichotomy pitted a materialist West against a spiritualist East. These peripheral pan-Asianists often interpreted what was a potentially imperial element embedded within the concept of pan-Asian alliance as instead affecting a new diplomacy, a new transnational political arrangement through a federation of equals, albeit knitted together through self-interest and what was a racially charged and materially unequal, amoral competition. It was these positive visions that they believed would protect their constituent nationalisms. And it was this alternative vision of the global international world order that they put into contest against prevailing Western. Into the Philippine American war phase of the Philippine Revolution, with in 1898, Clemente Huleta publishing an illustrated magazine called La Malasia that covered topics relating to the Malay race. Gregorio Aguilera and other illustrados, meanwhile, edited Columnas Volantes de la Federación Malaya, beginning in 1899, which aimed to serve as an organ for the Filipino people marching with and leading the Malayan people as a single federation. Apollinario Mabini himself published an important article in 1899, in which he declared that the revolution had as its quote, sole objective and final goal, the aspiration to maintain alive and bright in Oceania, 
the torch of liberty and civilization, so that illuminating the gloomy night in which today the Malay race lies debased and degraded, the revolution will show the road to its social emancipation." End quote. Written by Aguinaldo's closest advisor and the first Philippine Republic's Minister of Foreign Affairs, this is the strongest statement we have on the deeply racial interpretive framework and family vision that were operative in the Philippine Revolution. In a letter to a friend written on November 3, 1899, Mabini reasoned that God allowed for the existence of avarice because it gave him a tool through which to, quote, extend civilization and to eventually humiliate the proud and exalt the humble, end quote. This explained the existence of unequal progress across civilizations at different times, uh, but unified them as existing within a single universal narrative. Universal civilization is carried continuously and housed by many, indifferent to whether it lands east or west. Mabini theorized a role for inequality of progress across cultures. It allowed for the inevitable process of creeping decadence and decay not to stifle universal civilization. At the point of decay, a youthful, adapted, different nation would take up the mantle of universal civilization and breathe into it new life. While the propagandists had turned to history in order to diminish the importance of the Philippines' perceived cultural and racial inferiority, which they now theorize as a temporary historicized state, as well as to tie the Philippines to a history of past and universal greatness through association with Asia, the Malay race, and the rising power of Japan, Mabini took their theorization of universal civilization, which was oriented toward the past, and built into it a causal process that predicted the Philippines' future greatness. This intellectual move mirrors the one that took place more broadly in the transition from the propaganda movement to the Philippine Revolution. The propaganda movement had established a foundation for a Filipino nation built upon reclaimed Asian history and a reawakened racial Malay consciousness upon which a Filipino nation could stand. The Philippine Revolution of the Katipuneros took this intellectual armature, which was oriented toward the past, and prescribed a future for it, theorizing and mobilizing the action that would achieve it. Though the Philippine Revolution eventually ended unsuccessfully, Asianism continued to inspire certain pockets of Filipino discourse and world of ideas, albeit from the sidelines. After World War I, the Bolshevik Revolution and Wilsonian principles undercut the international appeal of pan-Asianism and pan-Islamism. After World War II, the suffering caused by Japanese occupation and new exigencies of decolonization and strident domestic nationalisms disenchanted Southeast Asia with the idea of Japanese-led pan-Asianism. Yet the distinct mode of critique and alternative visions of cosmopolitanism, modernity, and world order that pan-Asianism represented were neither unimportant nor short-lived in Southeast Asia. Not only did they abet and inform what would become the post-war discourses of third worldism and pan-Malaysian in the Philippines, but they are also embedded in the very foundations of the Filipino nation. Um, now I had a sort of quick theoretical conclusion, but I think I'm actually gonna skip it because I just don't know how long my electricity will last. Um, so thank you so much. All right. So thank you, um, Nicole, um, for your, uh, well, it, it started fast, but we'll try to, uh, <laughs> well, um, well, probably through our conversations, we can actually um, pick up some um, interesting concepts here. Um, so um, allow me to first give some comments. Um, part of the reason that I actually read um, Nicole's uh, book was because I was writing a, an article on how there was that uncritical perception by um, Filipinos towards taking pan-Asianism, or at least the idea of Asianism itself, um, because of the idea of the um, of the modernization model. But um, I, first of all, I'd like to I, I'd like to pick your brain a little bit because um, you you have you've taken a lot of um, intellectuals that look and define the Philippine nation, or at least um, Asianism, place, and so on. And I'm, I'm trying to figure out where they're getting this from, because um, at the very least within the Japanese context, when they were beginning with this, it actually began with anthropology. Uh, and it began with the Western anthropology, which looked at um, sites, spaces, to which they were now trying to um, identify race, and so on. Um, 
and of course, part of that problem now becomes this idea that uh, a lot of the intellectual capacities of anthropology came from the West, which they were trying to reject. So um, first of all, I'm, I'm, with the first part of your um, presentation, I'm trying to understand where these intellectuals were taking this idea of um, race or idea, uh, race and place. Yeah, so I would say this is a, um, this is a global um, phenomenon and occurrence. So the same, I, I would say that the same sources are actually animating this. It's, it's Western anthropology. And I don't see, um, a contradiction there in the sense that um, I think that a lot of what the intellectual history shows in this period, um, specifically for the creation of the Philippine nation, is this kind of paradoxical um, denouncement of hierarchical racial frameworks while at the same time legitimizing them. Um, and there's a way in which, you know, the these this discourse is taking place in the interstices of the colonized and colonizers imaginary. Um, and they're leveling sort of responses to racist um, frameworks in a similarly racial frame, which itself is problematic. Um, but that does not mean that the sort of the racial um, imaginings that they, um, that they come up with are only hierarchizing and um, sort of contradictory and paradoxical, they also have um, sort of world making um, mm -hmm. offerings embedded within them that are um, in a certain way and on, in certain dimensions, liberatory. Um, I guess it's just, it's, it's just a very complex um, kind of relationship between these dimensions. I don't think it's either, you know, Western or non-Western. And in all of these contexts, you see the ways in which um, it's a global discourse with lots of imaginings and borrowings between um, different spheres and while they try to so neatly um, construe an east and west of course it's not really like that and of course you know and their under their their constructions of race itself are so slippery and unstable um, and they're trying to fix something um, that um, isn't really fixed um, and on the one hand while they're trying to claim for themselves this kind of um, association with this um, historical Asian civilization and that kind of grandeur, which largely rests on ancient Chinese civilization. They're also racist toward the Chinese at the same um, token, the, the contemporary Chinese, while also themselves being mixed Chinese. So mm -hmm. I don't think any of this is very simple or clear. Yeah. And, um, uh, but yes, it comes from anthropology, actually. Um, it rests yeah. a lot on Western anthropology. Yeah, um, and just to follow up on a little bit, because you also mentioned this in earlier in your talk as well, where um, part of the problems of early Philippine history, at least, was um, the lack of material cultures and whatever, and you know the, the kingdoms and the nations and so on. Yet, um, that was actually the very base of um, Japanese intellectual thought, where they looked at these um, um, myths uh, and so on. Mm. Did any of um, the intellectuals even cite, because I didn't hear it from your talk as well, because um, with the Japanese intellectuals, they were basically working with, you know, the Kojiki Nihonki and all these, you know, all of these gods that came from these countries, mythical countries and so on. And that's how they sort of adapted the idea, the, the, um, the possibility that a Malay race happened because one of these things was actually coming from the South. But, you know, I'm, I'm wondering whether you've seen in your readings any of these intellectuals that even sought through these. Sorry, you cut out for a little bit, so I'm not sure what the meat of that question was. Are you, where did you ask if whether any of the Ilustrados reference the kind of more local religions um, mm -hmm. and, and myths and cultures of Japan? Um, more of, um, cause with Japan, they were actually looking at it from a, they were basing their racial identities and space from, um, from myths and, uh, myths and fables. Right. Yeah. And, um, and I'm wondering where then does the, where then does the Filipino or at least the proto-Filipinos, uh, the intellectuals, um, getting their ideas from, because, you know, for, uh, as far as of what I've read so far, it's basically them imagining a space without, you know, grounding or something. So I think, you know, one of the, one of the interesting, so there, there are multiple, um, so there are two phases. Uh, there's also the propaganda movement and then there's the Philippine revolution. But um, let's say, for example, in the propaganda movement, there's um, voices like 
Isabella de los Reyes, who mm -hmm. is a folklorist. Yeah. And he tries to really bring to the fore and ground a kind of local customs, local sayings, local practices, um, and to kind of assemble a Filipino nationalism around that kind of knowledge and that knowledge production. And he's doing this in the manner that the Europeans at the same time are doing it for the Dutch and for, um, for all of the smaller local cultures. Um, oh no, I think Rebecca Lebrana. Um, and um, the, the, his contemporaries, Jose Rizal and all his colleagues basically say, stop it, you're embarrassing us you know, don't show them what we really think and what we really do and what we practice and all our superstitions. Um, and, um, and he says, why should we be ashamed if that's what we what we we do believe and what we do think? And why is it any different than what, um, you know, the superstitions that you see in Europe? Um, so there's that work and there's a bit of a tiff there because this is happening not just with a sort of local audience, right? There is a, there is a level in which is a local audience, but the uh, propagandists are very aware that there's also that this is uh, any anti-colonial movement is happening on an international and global sort of level, and that's where you need that's where you that's where you're competing essentially. Um, at the same time, um, they're imagining this kind of construction of Asia that's not respond that is in some ways a response to the West, but that also is trying to reimagine history um, with with the diff with different kinds of reference. Um, and so they're imagining these shared um, past through shared linguistic abilities, things like that. Um, and through, um, yeah, trade um, mm -hmm. and sort of interstate um, and cultural connections that predate the Spanish. Um, and um, yeah, so I, I would say that that's the kind of thing that they're looking at, while on the same time, because these things are fairly remote, um, they're pre-colonial, they're abstract. Um, they're also trying to construct this like localized sense of place yeah. around which to assemble the Filipino nationalism. And because they don't, they don't have, you know, sort of an Angkor Wat that can be a sort of ready set piece to dress up your nationalism, um, they're, they turn to the natural world. Um, and so the Pasig River and things like that. Um, and one of the things that's interesting is the way in which they um, embed climate um, mm -hmm. and the particularities of their natural world into the historical development of the Filipino people racially. Um, and so that's something that is a very interesting um, offering within their thought um, and something that is um, unique, I think, to their thought um, in, the, in this time period. They really carve out a place for the natural world within the development and that you have constant ways of thinking given the place where your race evolved. Oh, thanks. Um, that's actually fascinating. Um, before we open the floor for questions, I have just one little thing. Um, in the last part, when we now move into the revolution, and of course, Japan now plays a large picture within this space, for ta even Taiwan as well, haven't any of the um, revolutionaries been suspicious considering that Taiwan and Korea during this time was already a colony of Japan? And, you know, part of it was the internal discussions of um, the internal issues where, where you had now this problem of hierarchies and um, identity issues within their spaces as well. So in other words, it could also mean that Sun Yat-sen for what if we we have to look at it intensively became a propaganda to towards this colonial reach of japan um i'm wondering whether mm -hmm. the, the intellect the philippine the revolutionaries were even suspect to this yeah i mean i think that there were there 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 are multiple warnings um from different voices that you know will just be swallowed up um but um there's 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 interesting sort of reasoning within this. So, for example, the Vietnamese um, scholar gentry, who are the contemporaries, they basically say it's not um, uncommon for countries to disappear. Um, we in our past absorbed different smaller cham nations. This can happen to us unless we start playing the geopolitical game more intelligently. And within this sort of social Darwinist framework, the only help you can um, look to are those of like races and like cultures. So if that's your framework, that yeah. means that there's a certain amount of risk and collaboration because it's a very fierce um, 
competition for survival amongst uh, survival of the fittest, right? If that's your, the framework that you're that you're using, and so there are many Filipinos who are voicing um, the same kinds of things. There's there are interesting ideas. So one was saying, you know, why don't we um, fall? Uh, uh, why don't we um, sort of fall prey to the Dutch? Then, with you know, however many millions of Malays all under the Dutch, we can easily overthrow them. Um, and there are, there, are, there are other, you know, there's thinking like this because they know that they're a weak country, right? Um, and then there's other reasoning, which is basically saying we need help from stronger friends and stronger neighbors. Um, and it's a dangerous game to play, but there's no way that we can do it on our own anyway. And so why not, while we're not yet able, lean on a really powerful neighbor um, until we can um, sort of surpass that. And then I would say that more generally, um, the peripheral pan-Asianists first kind of look at what is this sort of imperial element embedded in this idea of solidarity, um, you know, which is like this hierarchizing of um, Asia under like a Japanese leadership and see it as affecting a kind of new form of diplomacy. Um, I talk about this a, a, in a little bit more depth in the book, but so they're not um, naive to this imperial element. In fact, they're trying to, you know, they're also using Japan's strength to their, you know, they, they see it as a tool for them um, and that they're leaning on a racial instrument to sort of avail of that power. They're also trying to like ride on its coattails and basically say to the to Europe and to Spain specifically, you know, beware, look, there's such a powerful regional neighbor who can easily um, displace you and to whom we have a, uh, a racial kind of and cultural affinity and, and belonging. So if you do not give us the reforms we're asking for, it'll be very easy for us to turn to a regional power rather than to this foreign power that's so unstable and that does not look like it'll necessarily survive. Um, and then later on, um, as Japan becomes increasingly more like the Western imperial powers than the new savior of Asia, <laughs> um, there are always sort of voices that are trying to urge Japan back to what they believe is the true spirit of Pan-Asianism and the leadership that is required. And then there are others who say, we need to find a new leader mm. for Pan-Asianism, one that understands the true spirit. Okay. Thanks. Uh, I have more questions to ask because I want to pick your brain, but uh, we have to um, entertain the questions from the audience. I'll just read through them um, in order. Um, and maybe maybe you can just do, because depending on the time that we have, we might not be able to address everything. So apologies to the audience. Um, first, we have a question from Craig Murphy. Um, there's little, if any, doubt um, that colonialism by the UK and other nations caused and still causes stress for many people. Do you think that financial reparations by specifically the UK should be made? And how, if not, uh, how, if not, then why not? So this is like a colonialism, post-colonialism thing. Um, thank you for the question. I mean, I think it's a fascinating discussion um, and one that really needs to take place globally. Um, I do not think that I'm qualified to, to answer that. I'm a, I'm a historian really, and I, 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 I don't, I don't pretend to have, you know, the answers to sort of current day sort of policy questions. I'm just sort of looking at interpretations of the past. Um, I think there are convincing arguments um, for racial reparations, for example, after slavery um, in, in contexts like the US, um, but I, I really am not an expert in this and I would leave it to the experts to, to instruct me on what they think um, should take place. All right, thanks. Um, from uh, Edith um, Thierry, Terry, um, there is, uh, well, it's two parts, so I'll just read both, so maybe you can sort of condense it. Um, I'm sure that you covered this in your book, but what happened to Pan-Asianism after the conquest and occupation by the U.S.? Um, you certainly had, um, you certainly had illustra illustrados who were officials in the Japanese government and whose affiliations were conveniently forgotten post-war, but you could argue that pan-Asianism may have helped limit resistance to Japanese rule and blended and blended with anti-colonialism in the identity in the identity movement of the 1970s and even um, Duterte's anti-US um, policies. Um, and uh, her sort of add-on to this is um, also very curious about the idea that Philippine Japan Japanese trade was a unifying force in pre-colonial period when 
um, when trade with China was overwhelmingly uh, more present and influential. So um, it's sort of two partners and feel free to address what you can. Yeah, so for the second question, I would say that, yeah, empirically, um, trade with um, China was much more important. Um, and a lot of this resting on sort of like the idea of pre-colonial relations with Japan is trying to ride on Japan on the coattails of Japanese modernization and sort of, you know, emerging great power status. Um, and in some ways, it's a kind of tool. So like, um, Bonifacio ha, had um, Kalaya and the Katipunera newspapers say, say that it was printed in Yokohama. And of course it wasn't, but he's just trying to sort of like, um, yeah, rest on the, the power and the symbol of Japan that it was, you know, this rising Asian power. Um, so they're trying to co-opt that um, for their own purposes, uh, rather than it being actually um, a historical force that was unifying um, under the US. So first of all, I, I think, you know, it, uh, we, we should <laughs> never forget that the elites in the Philippines are always for themselves. So they'll collaborate with, <laughs> and I use collaborate in scare quotes, but you know, they'll work with any administration um, and they'll, they'll, um, they have proven um, very long lasting and willing to work with any. <laughs> um, the oligarchy is, is very established, very cemented, uh, very consolidated and um, very stable. Um, and that comes from working within whomever is in, whom in power. Um, and whatever is more advantageous for them, they will do. Um, and um, I think that, so over the course of the 20th century, of course, the place of Pan-Asianism within the Philippines um, changes over time. And as the 20th century sort of wears on and there's sort of, um, you know, increasingly a bipolar world, the best bet for the Philippines is to bet alongside the US because of the special relationship that we have by being a former colony. So if you're gonna bet on anything, that's really your strongest ally. And so that really um, enervates a lot of Pan-Asian spirit, but that it doesn't go away entirely because of course there are always strong critiques of um, American force in the world. Um, and it comes up again and again, even as the US is such a strong realpolitik kind of strategy for development, um, the sort of third worldism, pan Malayism, mafilindo that comes especially um, after World War II. So it comes up again and again. And the way that I like to think of it is, you know, and I, you know, I put Duterte into this also, but the, you know, the way that I like to think of it is Asia is just like this, um, this blank kind of index. Um, mm -hmm. It's, it's amorphous and you can use it as an index to sort of, um, interpret and evaluate and sort of like diagnose the prevailing um, geopolitical currents, um, fears, imaginations. Um, it's not a stable category at all. And so it's just a nice window into looking at the different tectonic shifts um, uh, over the 20th century and, and prior to that, but really the 20th century, at least in, in the way that I think about it. Yeah, thanks. And that's actually very interesting in terms of like identification, right? <laughs> With the Asia concept. Um, there's, uh, I think you've briefly addressed this, but uh, maybe uh, in more in more specific concept, how strongly were the Filipino revolutionaries and intellectuals influenced by the economic and military success of Japan in global affairs? I think this is the Sino-Japanese war and the um, Russo-Japanese war, I think, in part of this. Um, and the presence of Chinese immigrants in the Philippines in the late 19th century. So uh, this was a question by someone, yeah. So of course, you know, the presence of Chinese immigrants all throughout Southeast Asia is a great mover of history within Southeast Asia for, you know, basically all of recorded history. So I don't, I don't want to underplay that. I think that's a very important um, dimension and force um, that's often underlooked within Southeast Asian history more generally. Um, as for Japan, yeah, I mean, Japan's um, defeat of a sort of modern Western power um, for the first time in modern warfare um, was very, very inspiring. Um, and it sort of proved the ability of, of, of a kind of like Asian modernization. I do all of these, uh, you know, in, in scare quotes, but um, there is some literature, though, that is kind of revising this idea. So we, I mean, we, you do have recorded like, 
you know, um, Ricardo T. Jose from UP, um, you know, writes about, you know, Filipino students um, cheering after the Russo-Japanese War, running into, you know, onto, on, onto the campus and, you know, talking about how Asia has just won, you know, and so really, um, you know, identifying with this. So identifying with this vision of Asia that's be able to defeat, um, you know, the modern West on its own terms. Um, but by the same token, in the literature has generally assumed that the Russo-Japanese War um, was this stunning reversal that just blew everyone's minds. And, um, you know, it was such a huge thing that, you know, this Asian power overcame, you know, you know the, like a modern Western power. Um, and there's been, there's is some, so Paul Rodell um, did a study and he says that, you know, a lot of that assumption comes from actually a Western, a white Western point of view, where the white Western point of view was like, wow, oh my God, I can't believe this happened. We assumed this would never be possible. Um, and for um, Asians, it seemed a lot more natural that there could be a very strong great power um, in the region. And of course there had been historically. And so it was less, you know, jaw dropping and earth shattering um, maybe to other, um, to other observers. And he has a framework for how he quantifies and sort of evaluates the response to the Russo-Japanese war, which I don't um, really adhere to, but it's an interesting sort of, thought right and it's an interesting kind of debate um that i would say that actually for the filipinos not so much the russo japanese war but the sino japanese war is what has a greater um effect and that's what you really see um like la solidaridad writes about the sino japanese war like constantly um and this is something that really really inspires both the vietnamese and the filipinos at this at this time and by the time of the russo japanese war it's a little bit later um you know the 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 Vietnamese in Japan are starting to become disaffected and to see Japan act more like a Western imperial power. Um, and at that point, you know, the US is really starting to um, exert um, power um, over the islands. And so things are sort of realigning a little bit, but yeah. Yeah, um, I, I guess this is the part of the second question. I'll, I'll clarify it a little bit further is like, then why did, despite all of this, and this is somewhat related to your idea of Asia, right? Um, then why then did the intellectuals reject China and yeah. choose Japan, right? It becomes yeah. this fascinating um, concept, right? Yeah. Maybe you can... Um, yeah. Separate? So my, my best guess, um, hmm. because they're, they're themselves Chinese, right? So it doesn't make any sense. But um, my, my best guess is that they are working within a Spanish racial framework where the Spanish held a very, very strong racial bias and prejudice against the Chinese and categorized themselves as different legally and in every other way from the Chinese. And so the these mestizo ilustrados want to hold the same kind of place as the Spanish had and have absorbed this kind of racist framework and so want to hold a status higher and distinguish themselves from like the pure culturally unassimilated Chinese around them. Okay. Great, thanks. Uh, this is somewhat, this next question is somewhat related to my previous question in the sense that you used, um, in a lot of your quotations, you, um, a lot of the intellectuals used the idea of Malay. Um, would it be accurate to say that their view of the Malay is in a view similar to cultures or more a general location and ethnicity? So probably where is this Malay, Malayness coming from? Yeah, so you're, they, they use the definition that um, Western anthropologists are using, um, which relies on, uh, it's, a, it's a, a sort of ethno-linguistic understanding to um, race. So that's a kind of main basis, but they're also looking at like migration patterns, historical migration pattern theories, um, and things like that. Um, but I would say that they are really West, uh, uh, resting on Western literature. And it's also their way of kind of like shoring up their response so that it's bulletproof, right? So they can, it's basically a way for them to say to Europe, you know, we're not this kind of like anarchy of tribes and races that are, you know, forgotten in the Pacific. We are part of a larger racial grouping that has historical uh, force and a historical place in the world, and we're part of the Malays. Right. Thanks. Um, this is uh, from Emerson Rosario. It's a, it's a two-parter. Um, uh, how 
is there a connection between the propagandistas and um, Japan and the help of the Philippines during the Spanish American uh, Spanish and American colonization? And before the arrival of um, the Americans, did the Japanese send spies <laughs> to the Philippines to plan annexation? Sorry, I didn't I didn't understand the beginning of that oh, question. Um, I think it's it's asking the question of was there um, while you were looking at the intellectual um, uh, intellectual connections, um, were there Japanese that were actually involved um, directly with the Philippines um, during the Spanish and American colonization? Because mm -hmm. while you were looking at um, revolution. Uh, Philippine Revolution, we're also, they're sort of looking at the post-revolution as well. Okay, um, yeah, um, and there are different Japanese thinkers who have been thinking about Nanyo for a very long time, for, you know, the South Seas for a long time, uh, constructions of Southeast Asia, um, and there are Japanese who, for a very long time, sort of write about, you know, eventual um, annexation of the Philippines, about setting um, Japanese sites further south, about different ways in which you can help the Japanese empire, Japanese project. Um, so that, that's been documented for a while from in the basically in the last quarter of the 19th century onward, I would say it, it starts. Um, and there are, there's, um, there's a great article um, by Caroline Howe, um, and her collaborator basically um, Saicho talk, talking about you know um, Tacho the, and this this Japanese um, novelist who meets Rizal um, mm -hmm. on a ship and their exchange um, and he writes a book that's based on Rizal um, right. and the you know and the sort of this time period in the propaganda movement etc and, and you know um, so there's like a co-imagining um, that's happening and taking place um, so yes, um, and I would say that, you know, Sunya Tsen, Miyazaki Tocha, and these names, you know, they, they, they do really work with Mariano Ponce in thinking through um, anti-colonial strategy and thinking through sort of the bases of nationalism and of how to sort of construct these over a scale that's larger, a scale of Asia. Um, mm -hmm. Oh, thanks. And actually, just to add to that, there were actually some Japanese that were based in Taiwan that fought in the revolution as well, which makes it fascinating. But, you know, um, um, from the intellectual capacity this year, um, we have a question from Mary Rosales. <laughs> Get ready. Just kidding. <laughs> um, it's a, a really interesting presentation. Can you comment on how the Pan-Asian theme was presumably undermined by the transplanted American public education system via the Thomas sites beginning in 1901, plus soon after? Um, the pensionado program of bright young Filipinos sent to the American colonial regime to obtain advanced degrees in the U.S. and universities. Many of them returned um, in the 1920s and, and 40s to take leadership positions in business and government and so on. So um, were pan-Asian ideas then sidelined in the early American period? Hi, Mary, thank you so much for your question. And I say, yes, absolutely. And I think this is what I was trying to allude to when I was talking about the kind of coming, you know, the American century um, more generally. Um, I think another force that really sidelines pan-Asianism, so it, it really does, pan-Asianism gets sidelined. Um, there's no question about it. Um, that's not to say that it's, you know, gone. Um, it's just sidelined. Um, and it does reemerge and pierce, you know, the sort of mainstream um, majority public, you know, with um, Mafilindo, et cetera, later in different forms. Um, but um, yes, it's absolutely sidelined by the by the by American colonialism and by the way in which, you know, McCoy would argue that what American colonization did was so effectively co-opt the revolutionary spirit um, and project and funnel it into benevolent assimilation. Um, on the part of the elites. So yes, I think there's a larger program here that's working. I would also add that the dominance of American capitalism also mm -hmm. sidelines Pan-Asianism um, very importantly in the 20th okay. century. And probably to sort of follow up with what Mary has asked, um, does that mean that Pan-Asianism was not you know, deeply embedded 
or was there like this painful process of movement from the you know from the pan Asianism to the Americanism that uh, was happening in the Amer it, it, during the American colonial period? I'm sorry, were you able to hear my question, uh, Nicole? Oh no. I think, I think her, uh, Nicole, um, were you able to hear my question? I, sorry, I missed that, I'm so sorry. No worries. Um, it, it's it's sort of um, um, piggybacking on Mary's question. So um, given that it was easy for um, pan-Asianism to be sort of booted out by um, the American colonial period, does that mean that pan the idea of pan-Asianism was not as deeply rooted as opposed to you know the 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 American uh, ideologies that happened after? Um, so it's not that I would say that it's not deeply rooted because I think you find like these kind of Asian foundations to the idea of a Filipino nation um, quite deeply embedded in the, this constructed Filipino nation, the way in which it's mobilized, the way in which it's discussed. Um, and, um, and I think it's very important to their definitions and formulation of Filipino nationalism. Um, but I will say that there's a strong element, of course, and I think this is true for anti-colonial nationalist frameworks that there's the nationalist part and then there's the anti-colonial part and the anti-colonial part um, relies on like strategies in real polity kind of geopolitical um, risk-taking bargaining um, strategizing right um, and whereas at one point in time a pan-asian racial union seemed like the only and best strategy um, not you know, the best strategy basically for international competition, um, there starts to be a different calculus with America actually in the Philippines uh, mm -hmm. and the colonizer and then the relationship that transpires there and then with American ascendance in the 20th century. So I think the real politique changes. That's not to say that it also, you know, that kind of idea of racial solidarity um, and that racial strategy um, doesn't crop up again later, it does in different forms. So there's third worldism um, that um, is a global phenomenon of, you know, it's sort of the throes of decolonization where basically, you know, the third world says what's happening in the cold war really has nothing to do with us. And we are more concerned with our national survival and the exigencies of constructing nations on, in, the, in the wake of colonialism's destruction. And we're going to turn to one another. First, we're going to be non-aligned. And second, we're going to rely on each other. Um, and I think, and you know, this is a lot of the bases for different formulations of Southeast Asia as a region, et cetera, um, in certain conceptualizations, of course, not all. Um, but yeah, so I think that that's how I, I would I would frame it. That there's there's the aspect that's like basically casting about for how to invent a nation. <laughs> so I mean, I don't think that any of this is like really rooted because they're constructing it, they're imagining it, they're constructing it. Um, you know, even race itself, like you know the, and then um, then there's this the the part that's really instrumentalizing and strategizing. Mm -hmm. So yeah. Uh, this is so, sort of related. Um, another question here is, um, considering what's currently happening, especially in the, in the region, um, specifically with China and Taiwan, is a pan-Asian vision still possible in the 21st century? Yeah, so, you know, I, I recently um, wrote a piece in the American Historical Review that talks about this in, in oh, no, sorry, sorry, hold on. Oh God, wait, no, sorry. Sorry, um, but uh, um, I so I wrote a piece that looks at this. My husband, um, but um, I um, uh, sorry, sorry. Um, <laughs> he has no idea I'm doing this. Um, so um, there's a piece I wrote, um, and you know this kind of Asianist thinking and the Asianist offering for. Um, a new ordering of the international order does not die. Um, mm. And it come, and if you look at bookshelves, there's sort of, um, you know, so many sort of talking heads and um, 
sort of sort of geopolitical strategists and thinkers who talk about the Asian century, right? And and you know new forms of um, international order that are multipolar rather than hierarchical or bipolar, and you know these um, conceptualizations of um, Asian sort of diplomacy as being naturally more multipolar and fluid um, and about connection rather than hierarchy and things like that. So they're still around. Um, and there's, a, uh, so Parag Khanna is one um, sort of geopolitical thinker who just wrote a book on this. Um, it's a book that I reviewed for the Journal of Asian Studies. Um, there was a sort of revival of Asianist thinking in the academy um, in like the early 2000s when we, there was a lot of debates about modernity and about the kind of ontology of modernity um, and tried to dissociate it from the West. Um, so they were looking at alternative modernities, multiple modernities and taking seriously the idea of Asian modernity and what it offers. That debate was really, really theoretically rich but it kind of died because of the inability to conclusively define modernity. It's kind of just like, we know it when we see it, but we don't actually define it ever. And so there was a lot of really interesting philosophy um, and theorization that came out of that in the academy, but it has been sort of put to the side. Um, so I would say that it is um, alive and well. Um, that's not to say that there are, you know, that there, that it is actually necessarily possible. I mean, I don't think that even in the turn of the 20th century that I was talking about that there's lots of ideas and theorizations and conceptualizations, but you know, how long would this sort of like fragile solidarity union really have lasted? And then what did happen under you know the greater East Asia co-prosperity sphere? So I'm not saying that it's you know like necessarily possible or that it can kind of do away with the actual existing tensions, but it's it's not far from the imagination. And you can, there are lots of talking heads who still talk about it. Um, and that, and now I think the difference is that um, if before the Asian sort of future and order and modernity was offered to Asia, was offered to Asia alone, the difference now, when you look at it in the 21st century is they're now offering it to the whole world. Um, and that it offers a different model of the international sphere. Um, also, I wouldn't, uh, I, you know, if we think about Lee Kuan Yew's Asianist, Asian values, right? Um, and Mahathir Mohammed, and, you know, it hasn't gone away. Sukarno, um, you know, now I'm jumping back and forth over the 20th century, but, you know, it's, it, it's still around. <laughs> Great, uh, thanks. Um, thanks, Nico. Um, first and foremost, um, um, let's give a virtual applause to Dr. Kuing Heng Aboitis for her um, excellent talk, thought-provoking talk, and uh, was able to answer a lot of our questions. Secondly, we do apologize to everyone for not being able to answer all of your questions because of time. So, but um, nonetheless, um, first of all, thanks to Nicole for a very brilliant and very uh, you know, challenging um, talk, especially with um, the ideas of Asia and uh, Asia and particularly in the world. So thanks, Nicole. Thank you so much for having me. It's been a real honor. Thank you. Yeah. Um, so um, to continue with this program, we had so much excellent discussion, but um, can I bring in uh, Ms. Bambina Olivares, Program Director of the Manila House, to give her closing remarks to the event? On behalf of Manila House, this is Bambina Olivares, the Director of Programming, thanking everybody for joining us today. I hope you found the discussion most illuminating between um, Dr. Nicole Kuning Aboitis and Dr. Carl Chua. Um, we are looking forward to Nicole's upcoming book, um, and um, we all can't wait to read it. And um, we would like to thank also our fellow organizers who partnered with us today, of course, Asia Society Philippines, the Department of History of the School of Social Sciences of the Ateneo de Manila University, and we'd like to acknowledge the support we've received from the College of Liberal Arts, De La Salle University, the Institute of Asian Arts and Sciences, Far Eastern University, and the Asian Studies Society, University of Santo Tomas. This has been a most enlightening discussion, and I join um, 
Dr. Nicole for bringing forward these points at the time of um, the continuous search for Filipino identity, both political and ideological. I congratulate her for bringing this, um, the intertwining of um, in the intellectual streams between um, Asia and the Philippines during that particular period in time and how they kind of wove into each other to create the idea of the Filipino nation. And at this point, um, I'd like to I'd like to commend um, Nicole for her imagination and innovation in bringing this um, these strands of thought together. And in a way, it kind of um, reflects what Benedict um, Anderson said about what the nation was, which is an imagined political community, imagined both imagined and sovereign at the same time. And so she leaves us today with a lot of food for thought as we continue our evolution as a nation. Um, so thank you once again for joining for joining us. Don't forget that the book is available, still available, um, published by the Columbia University Press as well as Ateneo de Manila University Press. Um, thank you once again, and we look forward to seeing you at our next webinar. Thank you so much to everyone for joining. And um, thanks again to Nicole. And I think this is it. <laughs> and we have survived the electricity fiasco. Shargo, Shargo, constant brownouts. <laughs> yes. Okay. Thank you so much, everyone, for attending. It was, it was a real honor to be hosted by so many um, of our best institutions here in the Philippines and for Asia. Thank you so much. Thanks, Nicole. Thanks, everyone. Hey, Dr. Carl. Hi, thank you. Okay, so I've got